Alayhi salatu waslam is talking with his companion Mu'az ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the hadith is recorded in the sunan of Abi Dawood. And he says, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, Umranu bayt al-Maqdis, Kharabu yatrib. Kharabu yatrib, Khuruju al-Malhama. Khuruju al-Malhama, Fathu al-Constantinia. Fathu al-Constantinia, خروج الدجاج. and then he placed his hand on the knee of Maaz ibn Jabal and he said this is as true as I am touching you or come I call. The hadith begins with Jerusalem. That when Baytul Maqdis or Jerusalem is Umran, it's built up, it's flourishing, it is in a state of ascendancy, it's rising. Kharabu At that time, look to see. Medina in ruins in the state of forlorn desolation going down this one going up that one going down when that happens then the next great event that will take place in the world would be the Malhama. Malhama is what the Christians refer to as Armageddon. The great, great, great war. The big war. The war of all wars. Now, we therefore begin with Jerusalem. And we have to look to see Jerusalem rising. The Jews had been expelled. They had been exi in exile for 2,000 years. And then, stage one, Jerusalem is conquered. For them it was liberated. Stage two, the Jews come back to reclaim Jerusalem as their own. It's rising, isn't it? It's rising. Stage three, a state of Israel is restored in the Holy Land. It's rising. And now, the rest of us know that Israel controls the United States Congress. And any American president that steps out of line, like John F. Kennedy, you know what happens to them. And any French president who even begins to speak about Removing the sanctions on Russia, as the French president just spoke a few days ago. You know how they respond, don't you? You know how they respond, don't you? 
So this is evidence that Jerusalem is not only rising and ascending, it's way up. How much further must it go up? Must Israel replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world? Must Pax Judaica replace Pax Americana as Pax Americana had replaced Pax Britannica? Before the stage is set, we know that Medina is in ruins today. We don't have to wait for ISIS, the bogus outfit created by the CIA and the Israeli Mossad and financed and armed by Karnu Shaitan because that's how the Prophet Islam referred to the leaders of Saudi Arabia Karnu Shaitan and I say to them as you should also say to them you can kill a man but you cannot kill the truth so we must speak fearlessly and put our trust with our Lord. Medina is in ruins. We don't have to wait for ISIS to take over Damascus and then to march down to Medina to destroy it. <laughs> How much longer do we have to wait? We know that when the Malhama takes place or Armageddon, that it is going to be a war like no other war has ever been. And in a short while, we will know who are those who will fight in this war. And we will also know that it's going to be nuclear war. Oh yes. Because there's another hadith coming. Nabi Muhammad is giving us information and we are sleeping on it. We know that birds flying in the sky will fall down when the Malhama takes place. Because perhaps you can no longer navigate. There is too much contamination in the atmosphere, or should I use the word radiation, which is consistent with nuclear explosions. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ were sitting talking amongst themselves, Hadith of Sahih Muslim, when he came and he asked, what are you talking about? And they said, we are talking about the signs of the last day. One of the major signs of the last day, and you know that there are ten, the ten are not given in the order in which they will occur. It's a big English word, the chronological order in which they will occur. Which one comes first, which second, which we didn't we, we don't have that. What are the ten? Number one, Dajjal, number two, Gog and Magog, number three. The return of the son of Mary, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Number four, Dukhan, smoke. And the Quran says that one day it's going to be plainly visible in the sky. Number five, the battle of a creature or beast of the land. 
which land? Which land? I say the holy land of Abdul Muqaddasa. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine, three earthquakes in which the earth will sink down and swallow what it swallows. One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia. And number ten, that a fire will come out of Yemen. And this is not the fire that you use to cook. This is symbolic language. And drive people to their place of assembly for judgment. So of these ten, I want to turn to the smoke. A nuclear war will be one in which nuclear powers will use every single nuclear weapon that they possibly can use. Because it's going to be a fight to the finish. And so the world can now expect that if a nuclear war were to take place, excuse me, too late now to say if, rather it should be when the nuclear war takes place, when the nuclear war takes place, because they've already declared war on Russia. If you're living in France and Britain and in Western Europe, and if you don't know that your leaders have declared war on Russia, and the nuclear war is now inevitable. And when the nuclear war takes place, the thousands of nuclear weapons will explode. If you don't know that, then you are living in dreamland. And if you hope to survive in Western Europe, you are also living in dreamland. When it does take place, then I want to suggest to you tonight that the mushroom clouds which come from nuclear explosions, which will probably block out sunlight, so that there will be no sunlight in the world. For how long? I don't know. The Christians speak of three days and three nights of no sunlight. But there's a hadith which speaks of 40. I, am on, I want to suggest to you tonight, for you to think about it, that when the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam spoke about smoke, dukhan, is one of the signs of the last day, that he was referring to the mushroom clouds which will come from nuclear war. The Malhama. And we do have an answer as to how much time is left and how will we know when the Malhama will take place. I want to take you now tonight to the hadith which is in Sahih Bukhari in which the Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam that the river Sungai river the river Euphrates Furat which is in Iraq eh? The river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. A mountain of gold from underneath the river. A mountain of gold. And people will fight 
over that goal. And 99 out of every 100 would be killed. Indicating that this would not be conventional warfare. No. This has to be nuclear warfare. For 99 out of every 100 combatants to be killed. And therefore, we would be on fairly good foundations if we were to suggest that the Malhama would be fought for the mountain of gold. Those who will fight for the mountain of gold will all be saying, I will be the one who will survive. But the Prophet said that the Muslims who are present at that time should not touch the gold. Should not touch the gold. So if we obey the Prophet, والسلام, the implication would be Muslims would not be involved in fighting in the Malhama. The Malhama will involve others who are not Muslims or those Muslims who disobey the Prophet They will be part of the Malhama. So, that a mountain of gold will come out from underneath the river. Those of you who want to have tafsir you can wait for a long, 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 long time. Eh? Then one day, somebody will be there with a pan, and they will find a nugget of gold, and that will be the sign that the mountain of gold is going to come out now from underneath the river. That's the tafsir. There are ahadiths which are given in the form of mutashabihat and they have to be subjected to ta'wil so the flying donkey we know the flying donkey is here it's the modern aircraft and the fight for that mountain of gold is about to take place and that's the malhama And the fight for that mountain of gold is about to take place. And that's the Malhama. We say that it is an ocean of oil underneath the river, which one day is destined to function as gold. And that already happened. If you study the world of money, it will tell you something about how this money that we now use came into being. Where did this paper come from as money? When paper money first came into being, when the Bank of England was established in the uh, 17th century, it came into being in the form of a check. Or at that time it was called a promissory note check. So I write a check, you can go and cash it. Provided that you can cash the check, no problem with the check. But if I'm writing checks and I don't have money in my account, hmm? I went to the showroom, saw a BMW, motor car, wrote a check, took the BMW, I drove out. 
when they went to cash the check, no money in the account. That's called fraud. You go to jail for that. So at the beginning, paper money were like checks. The problem was that the bank that was issuing the paper would sometimes issue more checks than they had cash. Cheating. And hoping and pray that everybody would not come to cash the check at the same time. <laughs> so, if someone comes to cash the check, they don't have the money, they will say the machine not working or so, can you come back? Yeah? So the bank would not bust. But sometimes it doesn't work. And the whole thing collapses. That's what happened with the Bank of England. That happened in France. It happened in many places. It's also called a Ponzi scheme. The Zionist Jews and the Zionist Christians, when they won the First and Second World Wars, they decided they wanted to create a new monetary system of money that they will control. And uh, paper money came into being as universal money. It made a law that it is illegal to use gold as money. Well, Allah made it halal, but they made it haram, which is shirk. If Allah makes something halal and you make it haram, you commit shirk. And if I follow you in it, I am also in shirk. The system was called the Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods system. And they agreed that in order to have a, it's called a fig leaf to hide the shame, they will take one paper money, only one, and you could cash it for gold. It's called redeeming in gold. And because they wanted the United States to become the new ruling state in the world, replacing Britain, they chose the U.S. dollar. So at Bretton Woods in 1944, the United States formally replaced Britain, and Pax America formally replaced Pax Americana. When the U.S. dollar was chosen, that only this paper could be cashed. And the rate was? 35 US dollars. When you cash it, you get one ounce of gold. But that was only a fig leaf. The rest of the world of paper money was only paper. You could convert it to US dollars. So when you ask, what is the value of the Malaysian ringgit? No one will say, well, the Malaysian ringgit is worth so many Pakistani rupees. <laughs> huh? Oh, the Malaysian ringgit is worth so many Bangladeshi taka. No! Malaysian ringgit is worth so many US dollars. Huh? Because all the rest of the paper money in the world must now make sijda before the US dollar. Good. The problem was that the law permitted you, if you were a central bank, if you were a central bank, the law permitted you to take the US dollars and ask the American uh, government to give me the gold. The law permitted it. And one, one, only one, leader in the world, and he was a Muslim, General Charles de Gaulle. He was not at all happy with an unjust monetary system which gave an unfair advantage to the United States over France. Charles de Gaulle was not so much concerned about the fact that you could take paper and make money. What he was concerned about was 
this was advantageous to the United States and disadvantages to France. So he decided to, to sabotage the system. So he kept on giving the United States dollars and demanding the gold. Nobody has dared to do that. Nobody has dared to do that. Because you know, the United States has a big stick. But Charles de Gaulle kept on doing it until they removed him from power, the Zionists. He stood up in the French National Assembly and gave a powerful address condemning this monetary system. No Muslim leader ever did that. But we have to pause to give tribute to one man. The world has forgotten him, Ahmad Sukarno. One man, only one, in the whole world of Islam, only one. And Ahmad Sukarno, who today is forgotten, even by his own people, he was so against this monetary system that he took Indonesia out of the IMF. And he took Indonesia out of the United Nations. And there are Muslims today who are so to use a polite word, ignorant, that they would criticize Ahmad Sokano for taking Indonesia out of the UN and out of the IMF. But Imran Hussein says this is the one leader that the world of Islam could be proud about. Finally, in September 1971, after Charles de Gaulle had been removed, the French government again went to the United States with U.S. dollars and demanded the gold. But now the United States realized that the game was up. They had printed too much paper and they didn't have the gold. Normally, you should send the United States to jail. But who can do that? Huh? So what Richard Nixon did was to, Sunday morning, announce to the world, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep our word. That's America. <laughs> we gave our word that we would redeem U.S. dollars for gold. But we don't have to keep our words. We're not going to do it anymore. Hmm? So now, no currency, no paper in the world, none, can be cashed. You just write checks and that will be your money. Who could write the most checks? will have the most money. Yeah. So get a checkbook and start writing checks. The problem is if you have an American checkbook or a French checkbook or a German checkbook or an Australian checkbook or a Singaporean checkbook you could write checks. They call it hard currency. But if you have a Bangladeshi checkbook, a Pakistani checkbook, you can write as many checks as you want. You cannot even buy a cup of coffee in Manhattan. See? So now, you have a bogus monetary system which gives to the enemies of Islam the capacity to make as much money as they want by simply writing checks and let the donkeys in the world accept the checks. You don't have to work anymore to get money. No! In a world filled with donkeys, all you have to do is write checks.
You can buy all the oil of Saudi Arabia free of charge. All you have to do is to get paper and pen and write checks. But this is a risk you're taking because the, it's a house of cards, it could collapse. Once you had the gold, you had some security. But now the gold is no longer there. So from 1971 to 1973, they're searching for something to keep the house of cards strong. What they did was to engineer the war of 1973. And they were on both sides of the war. They were on the Israeli side and they were on the side with Anwar Sadat. And the Soviet Union was a Zionist client state. But the Arabs didn't know that. So they caused this war to go to a draw. <laughs> And then Kissinger, they knew that if the war took place, they knew that King Faisal, Rahimahullah, was going to impose an oil boycott on the United States. They knew, because Faisal had said, I will do it. And they knew that if an oil boycott of the United States were to take place, the price of oil would rise. In fact, it rose by 400% from $3 a barrel to 12. And suddenly the Arab oil producing countries were getting money, money flowing, flowing in. And they were happy with that. From $3 to 12. Kissinger waited until it reached 12. And then Kissinger flew to, flew to Saudi Arabia and succeeded in making the greatest deal that has ever been made in history. And because of that deal, an ocean of oil began to function as a mountain of gold. What did he do? He got Faisal to agree that Saudi Arabia would sell its oil for only U.S. dollars. You cannot buy oil from Saudi Arabia with any money, even with gold in ours, you cannot. Saudi Arabia will not sell, except for U.S. dollars. And then Saudi Arabia got the other oil producing, Arab oil producing countries to fall in line. And then came OPEC. And OPEC was the, the, the organization which kept the ocean of oil functioning as a mountain of gold, OPEC. So long as you could not buy oil other with U.S. dollar, the U.S. dollar no longer needed gold. Now, oil had now taken the place of gold. And the U.S. dollar was now flying even higher than it could on the Bretton Woods. Because in Bretton Woods, you had to keep some gold. You had to keep some gold. But the new monetary system, which is no longer the Bretton Woods monetary system, the new one is called the, the petrodollar monetary system. 
with the petrodollar monetary system. There is no limit to the amount of US dollars you can issue. You don't even have to print the paper anymore. No. They created something called electronic money. <laughs> so you do away with paper and with ink and with the security company with their vans and guards and all these things. And electronic or digital money replaces it. And uh, you can simply type in one trillion dollars. That's all. And so it really became a mountain of gold. That is what has kept the United States as the leading ruling state in the world with such vast resources that the United States has more than maybe 1,000 military bases all around the world. And every single misguided so-called jihadists who go and join ISIS could be getting 1,000 US dollars a day. Because it's free. <laughs> and so there you are. A mountain of gold has come out from underneath the river. But the prophet said that there's going to be a fight over it. And we know that that fight will come when the mountain of gold is under threat. Jerusalem is already rising. Yathrib is already down. When will the Malhama take place? Answer, the Malhama will take place when the mountain of gold, meaning the petrodollar monetary system, is under threat. Is it under threat now? Yes, it is. Who is threatening it? Russia. China. South Africa. India. And Brazil. These five are called BRICS. And these five countries, supported by others, oh yes, these five countries now want to establish an alternative to the petrodollar monetary system. And they are making headway. Yes. And now the stage is set where it will not be long before the BRICS alternative can threaten the petrodollar monetary system with collapse. They cannot allow it to collapse. That's why the war will take place. In order to preserve the mountain of gold, but they do not want to attack Russia without some causes bellum. They need to create a justification for war. So they've been engaging in provocation after provocation. And the greatest provocation of all that you can give to Russia is to get Ukraine under a pro-Western government and get Ukraine to join NATO and Ukraine is next door to Russia. So they knew that if they could get regime change in Ukraine it will lead to war. 
and they got regime change in Ukraine last December. No, sorry, one year ago. One year ago. What they did not calculate for was that Russia would respond the way she did. Russia responded by recovering Crimea. And when you study my lectures on Islamic eschatology, you'll understand that Crimea is of pivotal importance for the conquest of Constantinople. And that's what Russia now has, Crimea. The longer they wait to attack Russia, the stronger will Russia now become. Projecting power in the whole of the Black Sea area. And so my conclusion is that they have already declared war on Russia. That's what the economic sanctions are. That the president of France realized that when that nuclear war takes place, France is finished. And so the president of France was the first voice to be raised just a few days ago to say, no, I think we should remove the sanctions on Russia because he realized that this is going to lead to nuclear war. But the Zionists had other plans and that's why the two men came with hoods over their, shoulder, their head and they killed the twelve people. And then they went to some um, kosher restaurant and they left, you know, to say, well, we are ISIS or we are Muslims and so on. It happened so many times already in the past to put the blame on Muslims. And now France is in uproar. So the French president has to forget what he said about sanctions against Russia. Hmm? When the nuclear war takes place, we know that it, it's going to devastate North America and Europe, Europe East and Europe West. But Russia is not just a European country. Russia is also an Asian country. <laughs> so Russia will survive the nuclear war. I gave a lecture in Bangkok uh, maybe two weeks ago. You'll find it on my website. Please listen to it. An Islamic view of the world after the Malhama. What will the world be like? Hmm? So please go to my YouTube channel and listen to that lecture. An Islamic view of the world post Malhama. And also make sure you start getting dinar and dirham. This is Sunnah. This is halal. This is money in the Quran. Dinar and dirham. The price of gold has gone down now because the price of oil is being deliberately taken down in order to sabotage Russia. So this is the time for you to buy gold and buy silver, dinar and dirham. And they're being minted now in Malaysia. So there's no excuse, you can get it easily. What happens after the Malhama? After that, says the Prophet and the next event would be the conquest of Constantinople. Incidentally, the conquest of Constantinople indicates that Russia will survive the Malhama. Because there is no military significance of the conquest of Constantinople other than that the Bosphorus and the Straits of is it Darnadels or that? I, I, I pronounced it wrongly last time. The Bosphorus and the Straits of Darnadels uh, would now be open. NATO will no longer be controlling it. So the Russian Navy can now pass from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean Sea straight to Israel. After the conquest of Constantinople, 
the next event will be the khuruj of the jar when the jar will now appear in human form and he will be a jew he will be a young man he will be powerfully built he have the curls of the orthodox jews israel would then be ruling the world the ruling state in the world the state of israel has to expand its territory from the river nile to the river euphrates therefore war on egypt but all of these things we have already spoken of in previous lectures and then the jal will stand up in jerusalem and declare i am the messiah the messiah and uh, those who those who have tafsir for what they should have tawil they will say no he cannot be the jal why so he has two eyes and the prophet said the jal has one eye <laughs> see because they given tafsir when they should be given tawil when the prophet said the jal sees with his left eye is blind in the right eye the tawil is that the jal has external vision and he is internally blind and all those who follow him would be internally blind so he say i am the messiah my opinion and i can be wrong and the rule is that when imran gives an opinion you must never accept his opinion until you are convinced that he is correct that's the rule my opinion is that allah will not allow imam al mahdi to emerge until the jal has completed his mission and nabi isa alayhi salam cannot return until imam al mahdi has emerged how much time do we have left before the malhama how much time do we have left before the fateful constantinia how much time do we have left before the khuruj of the jal hmm? the only one who can answer such a question is the one who studies ilm wa akhiru zaman the fellow with tafsir cannot do it the, the mufti cannot do it with his fiqh no the historian cannot do it the political scientist cannot do it the economist cannot do it the only one who can answer such questions are those who devote themselves to ilm wa akhiru zaman that is how important this subject is i was thinking that perhaps we still have another 5 to 10 years before the nuclear war takes place when i went to iran to a conference in uh, september and uh, i normally do not reveal my dreams no i don't do that but on this occasion i broke the rules and i said no i have to reveal this dream i had the dream twice on the same night during the conference i saw nuclear war and i saw the nuclear missiles being shot into the sky and i saw that pakistan was a part of the nuclear war obviously that has to take place once nuclear war takes place pakistan has to be attacked because they cannot allow pakistan to remain as a nuclear power no doubt when i had that dream and i woke up I came to the conclusion that because of a previous dream that I had 2 years before 9/11 and 2 years later 9/11 took place I said to myself well if history is to repeat itself the implication is that Allah has sent this dream to me giving us the same 
few years time if the malhama is to take place in another two years what do we do and the, number one get out of the cities head for your kampung <laughs> head for the kampung number two stay away from big communities go to small ones small villages number three stock up on food number four stock up on water number food number food number three is food number four water number five life and death is in Allah's hands and when Allah chooses death the servant of Allah accepts death only Allah will know who will live and who will die but if you live after the malhama you got to be prepared after the malhama the big cities are going to be the worst place in the world to live why a city of 20 million people cannot feed itself it gets its food from outside it gets its water supply from outside like Karachi and when the malhama takes place the supply lines will be disrupted when no food is coming and no water is coming you're gonna have riots it will be dog eat dog people will be breaking down the doors of your home and coming into your home to steal your food and your water nowhere nowhere can you hide it so if you live in the cities it's going to be anarchy it's going to be hell in the cities and on that day when hell broke, breaks out in the towns and cities on that day when all hell breaks out in the towns and cities then you will remember Surah to Suratul Isra where Allah says wa min qaryatin illa nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawmil qiyama aw mu'azzibuha azaban shadida كان ذلك في الكتاب مستورا and not a single town and city will escape we'll destroy them all and those which are not destroyed will be punished with terrible terrible punishment and this is something inscribed in the book so when the malhama takes place wait to see what's going to happen in the big cities and towns so safety lies in getting out, withdrawing, going to the remote countryside and stocking up on food and on water. And then comes the conquest of Constantinople. And I believe that is why they created ISIS. I don't think they created ISIS primarily to remove Assad. <laughs> no. I think they created ISIS more to sabotage the Muslim army which would move to conquer Constantinople. Because ISIS will stand in the way from Arabs joining that army, joining with the Turkish Muslims in the effort to break the back of NATO and liberate Constantinople from NATO control. That's why they created ISIS. But if Allah has ordained that it will happen, it will happen. Constantinople will be conquered on the basis of an alliance of Islam, Muslims and Rome. And uh, we do not have the time tonight to enter into a discussion on that subject of the alliance with Rome. After the conquest of Constantinople, we have the Khuruj of Dajjal. It's time for you to study the subject of Dajjal. 
this book of mine, Jerusalem in the Quran, has a chapter in it on Dajjal, and this book is translated into Bahasa. Please now, after tonight's lecture of an introduction to Ilm Akhir Zaman, take some time to read the books I've written. Listen to the lectures on YouTube. You can down, download them free of charge. And begin to study the subject and take the Quran and start to use the Quran to study and understand the world in which you're living today. And I pray that from Adam Impian may come out scholars that tomorrow will be able to teach the subject of Ilm Akhir Zaman. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتبع علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين